And hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I am Darren Jaime. Today, we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough and New York City. Coming up, we'll discover a campaign empowering women to advocate for comprehensive obesity care coverage. Later on, we'll explore a new partnership that's focusing on skill development within Montefiore hospitals, which can offer promising medical careers to young individuals. And then finally, we'll discuss how one organization is implementing lasting solutions to various forms of violence in at-risk communities. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. Hello, everyone. I am Darren Jaime, and you're watching Open, a live program that's bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MN's channels. You can stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Some things have been going on throughout the past week. We're going to take you through them with some Bronx updates. We start with transit news, more specifically crime statistics. Bronx commuters using trains and buses have faced heightened concerns. The NYPD reports an alarming 87% surge in subway crimes compared to the same period last year. In response to this urgent situation, New York City Mayor Eric Adams recently announced the NYPD will be addressing the concern by deploying additional police officers across the transit system for 12-hour shifts. The city has witnessed an overall increase in crime by over 22% compared to the first two months of the previous year, coinciding with a tragic incident where six people were shot on a number four train platform at the Mount Eden subway station, resulting in one fatality. Now the need for increased security measures is evident in light of the alarming developments. In other news, New York City is proposing a significant expansion of red light cameras at intersections aiming to boost the current count from 150 to more than 1,300. Now, the proposal coincides with the city's plea to the legislature to renew the program set to expire on December the 1st. The existing 150 intersections equipped with red light cameras have collectively issued over 700,000 tickets, averaging around 1,900 a day. The Department of Transportation reports a commendable 77 decline and red light violations at camera locations since the program's initiation in 1994. Now, officials championing the legislation would mandate the DMV to suspend vehicle registrations for the most egregious offenders, those with five or more red camera light violations. Now, the legislative duo is anticipated to address the surge in reckless driving that's witnessed since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. Well, that's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We are taking a quick break. We'll have more open when we return. Happy anniversary to BronxNet 30 years. Wow, brings back so many memories. This exact studio that we were, that I'm in right now, I broadcast out of here. This must have been around 2003. I mean, time flies by so quickly. I started out here, well, it's either, it was either Mr. Gary Axelbank and Mr. Batch with Lady Moore Saab. We used to do a show here called In the Neighborhood. And I brought so many different guests on this show. To be able to bring your voice to the community is very powerful. To bring 
hip hop and spirituality. I brought my pastor in this same studio, Pastor Gino Jennings, and I'm sure you guys know who Pastor Gino Jennings is. That's rough and some disciplined teaching. BronxNet is something that we need to uplift our communities because this is a platform that we can come and if you have a vision that's in your mind going into your heart, you can use it to do uplifting things for your community. And we are back. Obesity is a chronic and treatable disease that has found a profound impact on the health and well-being of one in three American women. Now, unfortunately, insurance coverage for obesity treatments is lacking, creating barriers and limiting access to comprehensive care options, particularly medications. Joining me now and sharing is the CEO for the Alliance of Women's Health and Prevention, Melissa Gorham, and we thank you, Melissa, for being with us. Thank you so much, Darren, for having me. Well, great. I want to uh, start off because I think so many times people underplay uh, how really difficult it is with obesity and the numbers as well as the effects. So when we talk about obesity, what do you want us to know? Thank you so much, Darren. We, the Alliance for Women's Health and Prevention wants women to know that one in three adult women in the United States is impacted by obesity, living with obesity. 57% of African-American women are living with obesity. 44% of Latino women are living with obesity. Obesity impacts their physical health, their social well-being, their financial well-being. And we just want to make sure that women have access to comprehensive obesity care and treatment. And when we talk about comprehensive care, uh, I want to come to that in just a second. But when we talk about obesity affecting women in particular, the numbers are you know, really you know, quite, quite alarming. At the same time, do you think that enough people know when it comes to obesity that we really have a problem? Because it's, you know, from your perspective, you want to look at it as a chronic disease. Obesity is a chronic disease. Darren, no difference than high blood pressure, diabetes. So that's the reason why we want to make sure that women have access to comprehensive obesity care. Listen, obesity directly relate, is directly related to 200 health conditions. 13 cancers are directly related for, to women related to obesity. And that's the reason why it's important for women to make sure that they have comprehensive obesity coverage. We talked about comprehensive, comprehensive obesity care a couple of times, or at least mentioned it. Let's get into it right now. What exactly do you define as comprehensive obesity care? Comprehensive obesity care is intensive behavioral therapy, nutritional therapy, physical activity, surgery, and anti-obesity medications. So we're talking about across the continuum, that's the kind of care that we want to offer to women. And when we talk about this, let's go a little bit further. You've got chronic obesity, you, it's a disease. Uh, when you talk about a disease, going to see a doctor, let's talk about insurance. Uh, is this something that is covered under normal insurance? Obesity care is covered by just over 50% of all companies in this country. And what we're looking to do is to help more, more companies, uh, more corporations uh, offer comprehensive care, comprehensive obesity care as a part of their health benefits package. And there is a special campaign that you've got going on. Let's share a little bit about the campaign and how you want people to be attached. Thank you so much. That's the Everybody Covered campaign. This is a campaign for women to be educated about obesity, to be empowered, to have crucial conversations with their employers and with their elected officials about providing comprehensive obesity care. So we want women to have these conversations so that hopefully we can get comprehensive care through Medicare, number one, we want to make sure that Medicaid beneficiaries can get comprehensive care as well. 
Right now, only 16 states provide comprehensive obesity care for Medicaid beneficiaries. And we want to make sure that state employees can also take advantage of comprehensive obesity care. Having these conversations are very important. Uh, when we talk about having the conversations, bringing about awareness. As you're getting into communities and getting into circles with women, what are you finding? What we're finding is that women need to be educated about obesity. They need to better understand the impact of obesity on their physical health. We want to make sure that they understand it about how it impacts their mental health as well. And as importantly, we want women to know that women living with obesity uh, are paid less. They're paid 20% less than the women who don't have obesity. We just wanna make sure that women can take care of their families, their communities, and live their best lives. 200 diseases, are, uh, I should say, yeah, 200 illnesses are actually health conditions are attached to people uh, with obesity. And we know that's a major number. When you say a statistic like that, there are 200 disease, uh, you know, health conditions that are attached to this chronic disease of obesity, um, what kind of feedback do you get? The kind of feedback that we get is that women particularly are disproportionately impacted by obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis are all, all the kind of diseases. Again, 13 different cancers are related to obesity. So we just want to make sure that women can get comprehensive obesity care and treatment. If they can get comprehensive care for obesity, then those other diseases, diabetes, heart disease can be stemmed. You know, we're talking about equitable, equitable access and that is really what's at the forefront here. How do we get to a place that we could have equitable access when it comes to this? We can get ac equitable access, one, by supporting legislation like the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act that is now finding, winding its way through Congress. It's been around for 10 years, and we're just trying to help get it over the line. That legislation uh, will help to offer Medicare beneficiaries, our grandmothers, our mamas, our aunties, our best friends to be able to get comprehensive care, obesity care through the Medicare program. We want to try to make sure that the state legislators, that the state legislators can also provide uh, comprehensive care by dropping in bills that will help to take care of Medicaid beneficiaries as well as state employees. So as the campaign is rolling out, uh, talk to me about how it's going and uh, how things are going. Well, we're launching the campaign now. We want to make sure that women can go to our website at everybodycovered.org to find out more information on obesity, resources that they may need to have conversations with their employers and with their elected officials. Yeah. And with regards to health insurance, I know we talked about it just a little while earlier that that is sometimes uh, a barrier. Are we finding that health insurance companies are becoming more uh, in the area of gracious and accepting of understanding that first of all, this is a chronic disease and second of all, being able to provide affordable coverage for people dealing with this? What we would like is for women to be able to have those conversations with their employers and get the employers to better understand that yes, obesity is a chronic disease, that they're covering chronic diseases like diabetes, like high blood pressure through their health benefits program. And we want the same for, for obesity. It's only fair. Right. And if people are looking for more information, what are they doing? We want them to go to everybodycovered.org. That's our website where they'll find great information on obesity as well as resources to have com those conversations with their employers and with elected officials. 
And as March is, of course, Women's History Month, and this is the month to celebrate uh, women putting obesity at the forefront, having those conversations, and being out in the community obviously is a benefit to raising awareness. Uh, I'll ask the question on the side of women, are they really getting the message that, you know, hey, you got 200 health conditions that are attached to this uh, chronic disease. You've got something that you can be able to tap into to assist you in navigating. Are, are women really getting the message? We want to make sure that women are getting the message by having those conversations wherever they work, they live, they, they play, they worship, and to make sure that they are educating themselves and their girlfriends, their mamas, their aunties about obesity and everything that we need to have in terms of stemming obesity, stemming high blood pressure, and diabetes, those other chronic diseases related to obesity now you know knowing a little bit about you i know that you received several awards i'll just you know talk about them here i mean you got the uh black nurses association 2022 lifetime achievement award national action network 2021 well, well, mlk award is that you yeah that's me darren but speaking of that let me give a shout out to my friends with at the new york black nurses Association and the Greater New York Black Nurses Association. I worked with the National Black Nurses Association for 27 years, and those nurses are phenomenal. Those are the same people that we will be going to to have those conversations so that they can have conversations in their communities as well. Well, what I really wanted to get to was, given the fact that you've gotten awards and you've worked in this field so for, for so long, how rewarding is this work when it comes to the issue of really raising the awareness about uh, obesity as a chronic disease? As a nurse, you see a lot of things, but to really be able to tackle obesity and to be really uh, now a mouthpiece for it, what's that mean to you given your whole life's journey? Listen, the important thing here is that women get access to comprehensive obesity care. We want to make sure that women live their best lives. And they can do that by making sure that they are educated about obesity, the impacts of obesity on their health and their mental health and their financial health. We just want to make sure that they're living their best lives. Melissa Gorham, thank you so much for being with us and uh, raising the bar of awareness when it comes to obesity in women. And certainly, we've got the message out today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Darren. All righty. Listen, now, if you want more information, go ahead and visit the website at everybodycovered.org, and then follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Everybody Covered. We tell you don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open coming up right after this. We can't get anything done in this world that's so interdependent without communication. And certainly community-based media is really the core of that. You guys do a great service to the city of New York, to the communities within that city, and really for the entire state of New York, telling the residents firsthand what's happening out there. It's very important that we keep your facility going for as long as possible. We talk about the Bronx. We talk about it being a borough of opportunities, a global destination. We want to make sure that we create access and opportunity for future generations, creating local jobs, stimulating our economy, giving young people opportunities like internships that will not lead to jobs, but will lead to careers. Back. The Bria Public Charter Schools are educating and nurturing students from kindergarten to eighth grade, fostering their intellectual, social, and physical development while instilling strong character and a sense of purpose. Joining us are the school's network executive director and CEO, Jamie Valley, and also Chief Operations and Community Officer, 
Reyes Claudio. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Opportunity to talk a little bit about this great school. And so for somebody who doesn't know, walk us through a little bit about your educational institution. Sure, I'll start with the name and pass it over then to our executive director. Um, Bria means shine in Spanish. And at Bria, we believe that all students can shine and we shine a light not just on our students, but the families that we serve, the communities that we serve, really bridging the gap of educational um, needs uh, in underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Sure, well, at Bria, we are, it's, uh, I'm really glad that you mentioned how we aim to educate the student intellectually, socially, and physically, because we believe our ethos is that education is not only about academic results. Academic results are very important, of right. course, but we want to make sure that we foster an environment in which we are helping good people right. grow in, a, in an environment in which they can um, understand that it's not only um, what's value or what's seen in the outside, but education have to do with the way that they act, that they behave, and the way that they interact mm -hmm. with society. And so at the school, you have a character education program, right? Yes, yes and, we do. Um, and that's pretty unique in some senses, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens with this program, and how are students impacted? Well, um, the, the way that the program works is that it's not something separate, right? There are ways in which we teach character education implicitly, mm -hmm. right? So we have... Um, a character block, we, um, our approach is based on core virtues, mm -hmm. and, um, and um, we have the main virtues and we have like some other ones that we have developed, but also in ways that it's implicit, right? So we, we do things like um, the virtue of the week, um, in which our students learn about what it means to be, uh, to have courage, Mm -hmm. what it means to be a wise person. Um, we, our teachers pick every week a student that is, ex that, that is an example of these virtues. We educate our parents uh, because we ask our parents, so how you think your child is doing, um, how your child is doing at home. Actually, the parents are the ones that let us know if they are showing mm -hmm. these virtues at home. So it's, it's just part of who we are. It's part of, of, of the fabrics of the school. And, and our students get to experience it. You see it all over our building. You see all our vir virtues and, and everywhere, everywhere. Right. You go yeah. to, to our buildings and you see it. So um, it's, it's, it's just like part of who we are. And that's what we want our students to, um, to take away from their experience at Brea. And Brea, as you talk a little bit about having parents be a part of that fabric, right? Yes. Because mm -hmm. that's a key component. You got the student there, but you also have to have parents and parent sure. engagement. We know a lot of schools suffer when it comes to the issue of parent engagement. How have you been able to tackle that and be successful at it? Absolutely. Well, well, at Bria, we believe that parents are the first educators of their children. There is no way that what we do during the day um, will happen successfully if we do not partner with parents mm -hmm. and give them their right, right, parents and guardians, um, to be able to educate their children and be partners with us um, in stewarding the growth and development of their children. Um, and so we do that by having Parent University, where we invite parents to um, have workshops and learn, like, you know, what is this new math that your child is learning? Um, but also um, coffee and conversations when our principal and director of operations have families um, come in for cafecito in the morning um, to just learn about what's happening in this upcoming month. Um, so literally having our doors open for families and um, inviting them to be part of their child's um, academic growth. Yeah, and when we talk about enrollment, what's, uh, what's that like? I mean, obviously somebody might be watching right now saying this might be the place I want to take have my child, so. Absolutely, absolutely. so um, Bria is a free public charter school, and so the only requirement is an application, and we uh, host a lottery every year. Uh, the deadline to apply for the upcoming school year is April 1st, mm -hmm. 2024. Um, but we are also accepting applications live now, so we have a wait list um, and some available seats. So if anyone is interested, they can go to our website at briaschools.org. Um, we have seven campuses across the Bronx, uh, six campuses in the Bronx and one in New Jersey, um, and we have available seats. For yourself, looking at students right now and seeing how they're reacting to, you know, coming out of this pandemic, uh, academics have been a challenge for some. Uh, what are you seeing behind closed doors amongst the students? Because there's a certain amount of resilience that they're demonstrating, and also, I believe, you know, for a lot, a capacity to really want to get this. Yes, absolutely. Um, they're I, I don't have to tell you, like, all educational institutions we're going through the same thing right now. 
um, trying to catch the children, right? Like catch them up, um, not only academically, but also social skills, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that we, um, that's why our character program is so important to us. Some of our priorities are, um, obviously we have targets, like other schools have targets, but our, our priorities are, for example, like love center our community. We want to make sure that the students that are Abria stay Abria, mm -hmm. um, that, we, that we bring more people into our community um, because they have an experience of love in our community. And um, um, empowerment is our standard, right? And what, what does that mean? That we want to make sure that every member of our community our teachers, our parents, our students feel that they're learning, that they're getting something out of their experience at Bria. It's not only this, the teachers are being professional developed, are helped and equipped to be able to serve our children, our communities. Our children feel they have a specific targets that they feel proud mm -hmm. of accomplishing and our families feel that that's the right school for them, the right environment. And lastly, it's wisdom accelerated. We know that because of the pandemic, growing a year, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. If a child is behind two years in schooling, by the time they get to eighth grade, or the time they get to high school, they might be at a sixth grade reading level. And the ability to read is, is a matter of justice. And we need to make sure that our entire community is centered around that. So these are our priorities to make sure that we bring our families along, that we bring our kids along, and they have, um, goals for themselves mm. and 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 we want to accelerate their, their 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 learning to be able to learn they need to be able to read and we want to make sure that that's what happens when they are Bria. what's available for a parent that maybe mm, i don't have that educational background the way that i should right but i want to encourage my i want to encourage my child to be the best that they can be i might be struggling in that area do you offer any kind of support or services that can help in that area Absolutely. So, like I said earlier, um, with Parent University, we um, offer resources to families so that they can support their students. In addition to, um, I would say, particularly in our eighth grade, with our eighth grade scholars and in our middle school, we have a robust high school placement program. So that's something unique to our schools. Um, part of our mission is not just what happens at Bria, but beyond. Um, so ensuring that our students get into the best high schools to prepare them for college. Mm -hmm. So for people who want more information, what are they doing in terms of, like, we said that you have until April to get in, right? If yes. You want for the, for the, and then there's a lottery. Yep. And then after the lottery, then you get picked. That's what happens, right? Yes. You want, you want to make sure. You got to be in it to win it, though, so make sure, that you, make sure you get in it. What's it been like, though, I mean, with students in the enrollment? You've seen enrollment at the capacity lately? There is, there is definitely a decline in enrollment. Families are moving out of the, you know, families are moving out of the Bronx. It's mm. pretty expensive. Um, there are, you know, there's choice, which we think that right. is amazing, right? Our families should decide where the children uh, should be. But at Bria, we know that we have something special, right. um, not only for the kids, but for the families and for the communities. So we're here. That's why we're here. That's right. Please come to Bria. That's it. This well, is the school, you. the this best is... school in the Bronx. There you go. <laughs> yes. There you go. All right, well, we want to thank you both for coming, ladies. Stay with us. All right, listen, I want you to know, if you want more information, visit the website at briaschools.org. Follow them on social media at Bria Public Charter Schools. And we encourage you also, don't go anywhere. we got more open coming up right after this. I remember when the Bronx did not really have a media outlet properly representing the people of the Bronx. BronxNet provides for the community by being a community where people can be empowered to share their voices. We are in a really great place technologically. We've got all the resources that we need to be effective. Whether it's through cameras, storytelling, editing, we have provided those services for 30 years. BronxNet's mission is to be a voice for the community. To educate, to inform, and to inspire. And you can be a part of it. We've built studios for you. And we are back. Montefiore and healthcare facilities nationwide are grappling with a severe shortage of skilled lab technicians and technologists. 
Now, in response, Montefiore's Pathology has partnered with Bronx Community College to enlist their students as interns, rotating through diverse laboratories. And joining us now is the director of the Bronx Community College's Medical Laboratory Technicians Program, Dr. Diane P. Banks, and Pathology Lab Manager at Montefiore Health System, Natalie Velez Welsh. And we thank you both for joining us. Thank you, thank for, you. Having thank us. for having us. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, Dr. Banks, a little bit about the shortage in how long has this been going on? Oh, wow. So we first noted the shortage in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, we published some papers indicating that there was an incoming shortage. Um, we're seeing a, a high rate of retirements. The baby boomers are retiring. Right. And that was a voluminous group of people that was working in the lab. And so they are in abundance starting to retire. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing an, a lot of outgoing and not a lot of incoming. And so we need to really improve on that workforce shortage. And now it's gotten worse. After the pandemic, we're now looking at a 20% vacancy rate in the, in the clinical laboratory. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what are we doing here to try to reduce the shortage from your perspective? That's a good question. So at, at Bronx Community College, we're, doing a, we're, we're answering the call um, that was put out by American Society for Clinical Pathology. They basically said, do what you can at your local environments to increase the number of students coming into the program and increase the number of people graduating and getting into the field. And the partnership with Montefiore is how we're doing that. Um, we can, the college can mm -hmm. only bring in students when we have partnerships. Right. So if we're hampered by the number of partnerships and we're, the number of students we can bring into the program is reduced. So the, the, the great thing about Montefiore's partnership is now we can bring in more students, graduate more students, and usher them into the field more abundantly. Yeah, and talk to me a little bit about Natalie. You're an alumnus, and uh, what, was the, what was it like going through the process? A little stressful. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, I was one of the oldest students in, in the classroom, but it was, it was, it was a stressful environment. Um, it's a science. Um, mm -hmm where it's not as stressful as nursing, but it's just as intense. Um, and by me doing my internship in Montefiore, um, where I currently am employed, um, I found it a little bit more at ease and um, comfort. And that's what I expect to have all the, fur all the internship students that are processing, that are going into the um, Montefiore society. Mm. I need to do that all over because I messed up a lot. No, you did right. You did, no, you I did, did not. well. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about pathology and what exactly is you know pathology in the Montefiore Pathology Lab. Okay, so pathology, the, the pathology en encompasses laboratory science, yes. mm -hmm. and under the field and scope of laboratory science, we have pathologists and then we have the laboratory scientists. Um, and what we basically do is we help diagnose patients. 70% of the diagnoses that doctors share with their patients mm -hmm. come from us. We consider ourselves superheroes in the lab. And so every minute of the day, every, every hour, we are looking at samples, we're understanding them, we're diagnosing them, and we're providing that information to the providers so that they can then institute the, the treatment plan for the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Easiest part for you. Talk to me about what the, what the easiest part of this whole journey was for you. Um, graduating, <laughs> um, walking down that aisle, knowing that um, through all the stresses, um, through the career that I had at, at BCC um, and the pandemic, um, that I achieved what I wanted to achieve. And now I'll be able to further um, my career and provide more for my community. So what are you doing right now? Um, right now, after I graduated, but right now I'm just managing my department. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to take some time off so that I can focus on myself a little bit and then start studying again for my licensing exam so I can go back to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about choosing a career path like this, obviously there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, for yourself, how do you see the benefits? And I'll ask both of you the question, but I'll start first, Dr. Banks. So from my perspective, I'm looking at a global perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. it's an overarching view of the program in, in its entirety. One of the benefits is that I've seen students go from impoverished situations mm -hmm. to being in middle class in two years or two and a half years. That to me is a benefit. Now, like Natalie said, the program is rigorous. Mm -hmm. It's a science-based program and 
what we do in the lab and what we do in the academic setting, if we don't teach the students the correct information, they can go out and kill someone. Yes. Right. So it's important that we make the program rigorous so that when they get into the laboratory, they have the theoretical concepts that's gonna match the practical concepts that they're learning at the internship, mm -hmm. but they are understanding that each person, each sample that comes in is a person. Is a person. And right. what they do with that sample is going to dictate how that doctor, nurse, or PA is going to tailor care for that person. Mm -hmm. So the benefit to society is that we're gonna have more technicians and technologists in the lab working on patients' um, samples, helping doctors to diagnose these patients, and getting the care that patients need. So one benefit is upward mobility for those that's in the field. Mm -hmm. The other is patient care, quality patient care. Right. And so for yourself, being in this industry right now, coming from being an intern and mm -hmm. into the field, what's it like for you knowing that you've made that transition and now you have the ability to impact lives? Um, for me, I, I, it's, it's something that I'm really grateful for. I'm very passionate. I've been in the pathology um, world for going on almost 27 years. Um, and I feel that it's very impactful. I feel that I go home every day knowing that I made a difference. Um, that all the, all the patients that come to the facilities, to the hospital, to see the doctor or are admitted are coming to the aid of us in the, in the institution itself. And th even though I'm in the back end, I'm not in front view with the patient, I'm in the back end making sure that we provide the best services for their care so that they are more at ease. And you talk about a two-year program. It has the ability, really, to transform lives. You go from being a student, actually, uh, you know, to working in the field, mm -hmm. and at the same time, also able to generate a good source of income mm -hmm. uh, for really put that work in. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that income, because mm -hmm. <coughs> <laughs> right. it's good and abundant. Right. Okay. <laughs> so when students typically, when students graduate from the two-year program, after the pandemic, what has what we are seeing now is students are their salary is ranging anywhere from $58,000 a year to $78,000 a year on a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. That has not been seen before. But the pandemic had really put um, a, a lens on how important this field is. Mm -hmm. We have a pathway for students to get into the medical laboratory science program, which is the bachelor's degree program. And students that graduate from the bachelor's degree program are seeing salaries from $80,000 to $106,000, and that's without oh, overtime. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot. Of yeah. We, Pretty good. We make bank. She likes smiling. Like, yeah, I'm, <laughs> she's trying to hold it in there. I got, I, I, 27 years. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's, and that's, that's an awesome thing. So if somebody's watching right now saying, listen, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a little bit rigorous, but I'm up for it. What do they do? The first thing I would recommend them to do is really think about and consider whether you want to be patient-facing mm -hmm. or non-patient-facing. -patient -fa because at the end of the day, you have to want to be in healthcare. Right. And she and I, we have a passion for this. We love it. We love going into the lab and seeing a patient and calling the doctor, hi, this is Dr. Banks from the clinical laboratory. I have a report on your patient. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. And so if you find, if I, I, re I recommend it first, do the research. Make sure this is what you want to do. You want to do non-patient facing because this is for people that want to be in healthcare but don't necessarily want to work as a nurse right. mm -hmm. or a doctor mm -hmm. or one of those popular fields. This is for them, right? If they're introvert, if they're quiet, if they like hands to work on. with a, a team, mm -hmm. if they're hands on, they like to be in a lab pouring things mm -hmm. and pipetting things. This is this is for them. It's an ideal job for someone who who likes a hands-on experience. So right. so take me through a typical day. What, what's what's the day look like? Um, it's pretty crazy. Um, again, we work. At, I work at Montefiore, and it's um, one of the top busiest hospitals um, in the country. Um, not the, but one of them. Right. And um, we receive thousands of samples a day that we are expected to process and result out same day. Um, and in my department, what I specifically do is I am more in a specialized field. So anything that we cannot perform internally within the facility, we send out. Um, and we deal a lot with transplant patients. So it's very important that we treat every patient as if they were a family member because you know we don't know who you have. It could be somebody's mom, father, grandmother, child. We don't know, we treat it as if it was our own and we make sure we handle it with care and submit it to whoever we need to submit it to. So it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very intense job. Um, at least in my department, we receive over 1,000, 2,000 samples a day. 
Mm. Within the core lab itself, we receive several thousand samples a day. So it's a very vigorous, um, intense. Mm -hmm. Right. And so students come in, prepare. Uh, they've spent two years in getting this. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing, they're moving on. Yes. They're moving on. They're working in the clinical laboratory. You see, we have created a dynamic program at Bronx Community College. We usher, we help the students, we usher them into the program, we're with them for the two years that they're in the program, and then we help them post-graduation. Um, I would recommend if, if students really, if a potential student really think they, they want to do this career, go to our BCC website, mm -hmm. bcc.cuny.edu, check out the MLT um, page, learn a little bit, Google some information, um, see if this is the best fit, because once you're in, we're going to take care of you. Yeah. Well, I want to let you, let you know, thank you so much for coming and being with us. Exciting program. Mm -hmm. uh, as you make the best of it, continue to make the best of it. And uh, we look forward to having you back. Thank, thank you, you so much. All righty. Listen, I want to let you know, if you want more information, do me a favor. Visit the website, bcc.cuny.edu. And, of course, follow them on Twitter and Instagram at bccuny. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We're coming back with more open right after. Congratulations, BronxNet, on 30 years. You started when I was born. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. This is Verona, the dancing reporter for Create Your World, and I thank BronxNet for being here uh, to help me produce my show. Seven percent of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. Discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, Visit BronxNet.org to learn more. And we are back. Both Sides of the Violence Incorporated is a not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to crafting enduring solutions and resources that are aimed at addressing all forms of violence affecting individuals and highly vulnerable communities. Now, the organization is committed to supporting victims of perpetrators of gun violence. Here now and sharing more, we've got the CEO and founder of both sides of the Violence Incorporated, Shaniqua Coco Purvis. And uh, Shaniqua, thank you so much for being with us. Hey. Hey, and uh, we're glad, glad to have you with us, sharing a little bit about your story and the work that you're actually doing. And you're quite passionate about it. When we talk about violence, I mean, obviously, um, you come from a place where violence was right at your doorstep. And so, Give us a little bit about how we got here. So December 28, 2002, my sister was murdered by a stray bullet that came in the window of her bedroom. It was three days after Christmas, and I was the one who actually found her body. And um, that day is kind of like a blur, but yes, it was right at our doorstep. And when we talk about going through that experience, again, my condolences and... You know, we tell people that, uh, you know, going back on things, we're very thankful that you just are able to share with us because it's part of the journey of how you actually got here um, to really be a voice for both sides, um, really addressing the issue of violence, violence prevention. Uh, but then also, we'll talk about a little bit later on, you know, perpetrators as well. So as things continue to form formulate, um, where'd you go from there? So in 2014, I decided to be a violence interrupter. 
for SOS Best Eye, which is Save Our Streets, an anti-violence organization that's in Best Eye, Brooklyn, because that's where I'm from, born and raised. So I started doing that work, and I was I was always um, giving back to my community, um, organizing events, giving away things, doing community events. And when I got into violence interruption, I was really, really digging deep into gangs and really um, assessing high-risk youth and what they were thinking and what made them commit crimes and what they really, really... So once I did that, I did that until 2019, and then I went to Man Up as a program manager in Best Eye, yet again, in Roosevelt Houses. Once I um, encountered a participant who actually was about to, you know, go to jail for murder, I was really talking to him, and I was thinking about, you know, what would I say to the person who, you know, murdered my sister? And just so happened, you know, in God's intervention... He actually came home and he was looking to speak to someone in the family, mainly me or my mother, because I'm the old five girls. So um, I decided to talk to him 18 years later um, after my sister's murder. And he taught me a lot in that three hour conversation that perpetrators are victims, too. And I never looked at it like that. You know, we 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 grew up on an eye for an eye. Right. You know, not realizing, you know. The, compl- the the repercussions of that. Yeah, we, we talk about having a conversation with the perpetrator, and namely the perpetrator that murdered your sister. Um, what, what were you expecting? Were you expecting closure, or were you expecting the opportunity to have an understanding? I was expecting closure because, you know, we all grew up in the same neighborhood of Tonkin's Houses in Brooklyn. So I knew his family. I used to be in his mother's house playing cards. I knew his sister. His sister grew up with my sister. Like, we all knew each other. He was much younger than us, but, you know, we knew of his existence. Like, you know, he was always, like, a little problem, what we might call a problem child in the the neighborhood. But it was pretty much for closure and to see if he was genuinely sorry. Right. But now having that... Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, so he definitely was. And in his conversation, he remembered things about myself that I, you know, didn't think he would. I was 17, and I used to take the kids out the neighborhood, you know, just to show them something else in Manhattan. I was a foot messenger. So I would be privy to a lot of free things in the city, and I would take the kids out the prize and take them to the city. And he was like, I wish I was one of those kids that you used to take out the city, take out to the city. And I was like, wow, you remember that? Like, you know, and once he was things about his childhood and all the trauma he went through, I felt sort of kind of accountable as a community leader, as a big sister, as a mom, like you know, I should, I didn't want to take the bad kids, I took the so-called good kids, which they really were, but you know, I wasn't really trying to deal with the high risk and maybe, you know, in that conversation and I was thinking they'd take him out if I did do th- do things with him and showed him that he was important, that he mattered. Maybe this would have never happened. So now you got your organization and you look at it from both sides, actually, the victim and the perpetrator. Exactly. Let's talk about the work that you're doing right now. So as of right now, I'm in the schools, I'm in the jails, I'm in the churches, I'm in the hospitals, I'm on my community board, I'm on a 79th Precinct Clergy Council, I'm, I'm going to be announced today as the community liaison for the 79th Precinct um, Community Council, and I'm on the Clergy Council, I am a minister, and I do a lot, a lot of work in our communities, in our community centers, and I have a girls group, I have a peer, um, peace group, peace circle group. And I'm just starting my siblings group. Mm-hmm. So it's siblings who lost a, a sibling to gun violence or a sibling to incarceration. So we, like I said, looking at, at it from both sides. Yeah. It's often said that many times in inner city neighborhoods, we do have young people that only operate in a 20 by 20 block radius. They don't get the opportunity to have uh, much exposure, uh, particularly in areas of poverty and then also in areas of inner cities. We see that to be a primary statistic. Talk to me about yourself, who created some exposure for some young people. How much does exposure make the difference uh, to somebody who may only be in that 20 by 20 block radius? 
So I was privy to be the associate director of a program called Project Restore Best Star that was under our DA, um, Brooklyn DA Eric's. And we had gang members um, for a year, um, paid them $25 an hour to work and do internship. And we took them camping. And <laughs> it was a, a, a wonderful slash crazy experience because to see people who's never been out of their circumference, out that 20 block, I don't even think it's 20 blocks. Most of them was five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, five right. Blocks. I mean, we're being so generous, but went, yeah. They, yeah, and when they went and picked up the chickens and saw the sheep and saw the, uh, the goats real good, he's like, I never saw a chicken before. I never saw a rooster before. Like, and these are grown men. So... But, you know, they're in a gang, and there's nothing wrong with being in a gang. It's just what you do in a gang, you know? So, you know, we had them for a whole year, and unfortunately, we lost funding, but that was a great experience, and it taught them a lot, like, about life, period. So a lot of them are now, some of them in Columbia University, some of them going to schools. Most of them got their GEDs and high school diplomas, and they, most of them are employed. And we still service them in the community centers with workshops and teaching them how to facilitate workshops. Amazing work. Congratulations there. Uh, I want to also have an opportunity to talk to you about your LLC. You got a uh, focusing on the realities of me it's called For Me. And uh, what's that about? So For Me is focusing on the realities of me with our young women, high risk young women. So I do believe yeah, a lot of women went they don't know themselves. Like, they don't have too much, um, they don't, there's a lot of self-care that they need to, 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 to learn. They need to know how to love themselves. And focusing on the realities of me is, is dealing with that. So we have workshops with hygiene, um, um, financial literacy, um, um, pregnancy, um, health, I, like we have a whole bunch of workshops and programs to get to know themselves. So when I say focusing realities of me is focusing on your reality, whatever it is, and I'm gonna need you to you know focus on that. I need you to really focus on that because I believe that the the power of knowing yourself is really <laughs> phenomenal. And a lot of these high risk young ladies don't know themselves, and I just help them figure themselves out so that they could be better people. What was the turning point for you to say, listen, you know what? I really can make a difference in this community. I really can do something. Uh, I got this trauma I'm dealing with, uh, and I got this pain I'm dealing with, but I do understand I can make a difference. When was that turning point for you? I guess the turning point for me was when I was raising other people's kids. <laughs> like, I wasn't just raising my kids. I was raising other people's kids, and the whole neighborhood would call me ma, auntie. Like, they really depend on me. I have seniors who depend on me. I have our youth, our boys, our gang members, our police department, our hospitals, our schools that call me all the time, nonstop, needing help, and I'm always able to help them. So once I saw that, you know, my the kids that I raised was, you know, doing so well and going to college and getting great jobs and careers, I said, yo, I, I, I think that, you know, I should be able to help more people and yeah. get out my circumference too, because now I'm also people in the Bronx with my fiance. And so for yourself right now, what are the goals? I mean, you've got your organization going and you're, you're impacting lives. Uh, what do you have coming up in the near future? Well, the ultimate goal is to not have gun violence at all, for families not to go through what my family went through and what the perpetrator um, of my sister's crime, go, his family went through. That's the ultimate goal. But right now, I'm just trying to get a base, like get some funding where I can have a building, um, um, have a place for them to come, a safe haven in bed -Stuy. And Grand New York, Baltimore, Philly, like all the places, Chicago, all the places that they really, really need genuine help, get real resources in all of these communities. So I'm just looking for enough funding where 
I could be able to service people better. Because most of the time, the stuff that I'm doing, I do it from my heart. <laughs> I don't get paid for most of the stuff I do. Right. And, and a safe haven is the thing that you're talking about the most, because I think if sometimes we could give people that, they have the opportunity to reach a place, go to a place, and get some, you know, counsel, or at the same time just be heard, makes all the difference in the world. Right. So my peace circles that I have every other week um, in conjunction with um, FEC, Bad Style, with ACS, that peace circle is so important because they come every other week just to sit, talk, pray, eat, tell me whatever is going on in their mind and anything I can you know, do, I'm going to do. I had a 12-year-old telling me that, you know, the cops was harassing him. And I know for a fact that, you know, the cops in my neighborhood, they are very, very about, they they are about community. Mm -hmm. So I was able to mediate the situation with him and the police officers and have CCRB come in as a resource so he could know his rights. And when they finally um, looked into the situation with him and his friends, the situation went smooth because of that mediation. So he was not. He actually came home and he was able to be on probation and I have a, a contact with his probation officer so we could do what's best for him and not incarcerate him. Very interesting work there that you've been able to do because uh, given the heightened climate that we're in right now, being able to reach sometimes and touch people and have a you know intervention, if you will, doesn't always happen, but it seems as though you got the secret sauce for what's the secret sauce for you being able to reach these people right where they are? Being outside. Outside. <laughs> I'm outside. I'm consistent. That's another thing that our youth need, consistency. You can't just say you're going to do something and then next week you forget about them. Right. Next month you forget about them. No, you have to stay consistent, whether they're doing good, whether they're doing bad. Let them know that you're here still. Well, definitely needs to, it definitely needs to be underscored when you say we're outside because being outside means that you're visible and that you have connection. And being outside means that you're just not making decisions from behind a desk or, you know, for like we are right back here, that you're really out there with boots exactly. on the ground. And that, and, that makes, and that makes a huge difference. So we're out of time, but I do want to thank you, uh, Shaniqua Coco Purvis, for sharing. She's the CEO of both sides of the violence, and uh, she talks with the victims as well as perpetrators and does some great work. So thank you so much for uh, being with us. Now, for more information, you can visit the website at bsvinc.org and then follow them on social media at Both Sides of the Violence Incorporated. Well, we come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us, but most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast on Optimus Channel 67. Rise and Files, Channel 2133, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Rita Valentine on Friday. And guess what? She'll be the Cafe Con Leche and bring you all that you need to know. All right, that about wraps up this episode. I'm Darren Jaime telling you to stay safe. Make sure you keep this channel wide open. Take care and God bless.